of the things we talk about on Survival Tips and at survivalnewsonline.com is self-reliance as it relates to developing survival skills. A lot of your survival skills are developed from a mindset of self-reliance, which is why I talk about things like making your own soap, making your own activated charcoal, learning how to make a fire, how to tie knots. Uh, but I have really gotten into, you know, how much I like food, and so I talk about how to preserve food and how to cook food that's been stored for a long time and still make it delicious. One of the things that I've been getting into lately is home brewing. Now, as a self-reliance thing, it's right up there, man. You can make your own beer. But I don't want to clog everybody's inbox with a bunch of videos and articles that you're not interested in. Watch this video. If you're interested in this topic, subscribe at jigheadbrewing.com so you'll get the articles and subscribe at YouTube slash Jighead Brewing. That way you'll be notified of all the videos that we upload. So, if this is a topic you like, go there. If it's not, nobody's forcing you to watch it, <laughs> okay? But we'll have a lot of fun making these videos and delivering them to you so that you can see how and what we learn about home brewing. This is going to be a completely open source beer development program. You can track the development of our beers at jigheadbrewing.com. I'm going to tell you everything. I'm going to tell you all the secrets, all the ingredients, all the techniques. I'm going to give you the recipes. And we've already got several recipes up at the website, jigheadbrewing.com, in beer XML format so that you can download those and upload them to your own beer making software that's compatible with beer XML. My name is Manny. I've been blogging and writing articles and making videos for a long time. I have a blog at survivalnewsonline.com that talks about um, like preppers, how to get ready for likely emergencies. So like if you live in Florida and you gotta get ready for a hurricane, right? If you live in California, earthquakes is gonna be an issue. If you live in the Northeast, you gotta be prepared for ice storms and blizzards. So I've got some experience making videos and writing articles about topics that interest me. And I'm starting a new channel on YouTube and a new website, jigheadbrewing.com. I want you to know about everything that we do in home brewing. Now, I'm not an expert home brewer. This is just something I've gotten into as part of developing my skills in self-reliance. Like, I taught myself how to make soap. I've taught myself how to make clothes how to preserve meat. Let's take a look at some of these beers. I know this says Irish Red Ale, but it, that's because that was the kit. But the recipe evolved as we were going and it turned into an amber. Uh, this one is the Muscalunge IPA. This, my friends, is a mango bomb. And I would review it first for you today, but it's not ready yet. This is gonna be a fantastic brew. And the interesting thing about it is that I didn't use any fruit. I want to tell you so much about it, but I need to come back to it later, okay? I just want to tell you it's Muscalunge IPA and it's a mango IPA that you're gonna love. This one is a Bière de Garde, which is a northern French style of beer that's designed for long storage so that it doesn't, you know, deteriorate. This one is gonna be ready. It was bottled the same day as the Muscalunge, so it's gonna be another 10 days or two weeks before it's ready to test. This one, the Irish Red Ale, which is actually an amber, should be ready now, except I use DME uh, as a primer instead of corn sugar. So it's taking, you know, it's been almost a month, but I opened it yesterday and it's almost there, but it's still a little flat and it's still tasting a little young, like it's got too much active yeast in it. I do have a beer for you today that we're gonna test. But first, let me show you around a little bit, just kind of orient you in this, in this place. So, this is all real, okay? This is, this is actually my house that really is the messy part of my basement. We had to move a bunch of stuff out of the way so that we could make room for this little setup. Camera lights, so this is like reality TV. I have crammed everything I could into this small space. I cleared off a bunch of stuff that had been canned meat. I've got a little bit of it left up here. 
But this is where I keep my bottles and my beers and uh, this is the table that we do the racking. This is my favorite part of the whole thing is actually drinking the beer. I've got a couple of kegs in here. I am cold crashing a brown. I like making my own beer and sometimes I knock it out of the park, man. I make, an, I make a fantastic beer. I don't know, maybe better than the commercial ones out there of the same style. Consistency is hard to get. I bought a lot of equipment to do this. This is the most expensive beer I've ever had. I'm not saving money making my own beer. I'm just doing it because it's a hobby that I enjoy and I like making exactly the beer that I want. That's a lot of fun, but it's not cheap. I knew that going in and I thought that I would stop buying so much commercial brew. I haven't. I still buy the stuff. This is a Polliner Hefeweizen that is a better example of this style than, than mine. I like to get a commercial pale ale that's very well done and drink it and think about it and enjoy it and then see if I can make one that's as good. Here's a Kentucky ale which is a marriage of traditional English pale ale and Irish red ale styles. So basically they did something similar to what we did with our red ale which is <laughs> modify the recipe after we bought the kit and came up with something that might not fall within the BJCP guidelines for a beer, but that's so good that you still want to sell it and you want to buy it. I know most of you guys know how to do this, but I didn't when I first started. So if you got any newbies out there and don't know how to force carb, let me show you how to do it. I hooked the high pressure gas line into this um, keg so that I could put 30 pounds on it. The beer is already cold and now listen to this. I'm going to turn this down a little bit so it'll stop. All right. So now there's no gas going. But I want you to notice when I start shaking this that is going to start passing more CO2 gas through the line. Hear that? It simply means that the gas that is in the headspace of the keg is being dissolved into the solution, into the water, the, the beer. That reduces the pressure above the headspace. So more gas has to come in. So here's the trick. Get that stuff cold, 34 degrees. Turn up the pressure, 30 pounds, and shake it. Three, four, five minutes later, it'll be carved to your liking. I spent 10 days trying to get something carbonated one time and I just couldn't figure out what the problem was. Well, a little shaking did it. All right, so I'm gonna take this one back off and I'm gonna release the pressure because I don't wanna serve this beer at 30 pounds. All right. I'm serving this at about six pounds. I'm gonna get a glass, fill it, and we're gonna check out the beer. You need a nice clean smooth glass if you want to see the lacing in your beer because if you have a wet glass or one that has a lot of like a film from the dishwasher that can interfere with the lacing and so you might have it available and it just doesn't show up on your glass. Whoa! Hilarious. That is hilarious. I'm not sure why I did that. Because I had the pressure did down. You, is this the one that you just oh, took no, it no, out no, no. of? That's it. I've got the wrong one on there. <laughs> this is the one I need. I took off the 30 pound gas line and then put it back on instead of putting on the 6 pound gas line. The stuff is properly carbonated, but it just pushed through the line too fast under 30 pounds of pressure without enough resistance in the line because the line's too short for 30 pounds. So the CO2 comes out of solution in the line and you get a bunch of foam. Hope I can get that. All right, let's try this again. Fingers crossed. That's better. That's a nice head. Let's go check it out. It's 
smells just like a Belgian Saison beer. It's got a very fruity smell, like an orange peel, uh, which is appropriate because we use sweet orange peel and lemongrass. It's got a little bit of funkiness, almost a, a light sourness to it that a wheat beer gets. Ooh, the color's nice. It's light. It's highly carbonated. It's got a good head on it. The first thing that hits you is a real subtle, pleasant, citrusy f flavor. The next thing you get is a fairly quick dry finish, just slightly sour, probably from the high carbonation. It's got a tingling effervescence. It's a lot of the aspect of this beer that makes it so refreshing. It's got a dry finish. It's got a light supporting bitterness that lingers into the finish and leaves you without any sweetness or uh, syrupiness. It invites the next drink right away. I need to explain to you about the lacing. You can see how the foam is lacing on the glass. I think it could do a little better. This isn't quite the Belgian lace that, that I'd like to have, which is like breaking apart as it goes down the glass, but this is still pretty good. What it indicates is that there are compounds in the beer. These compounds do affect the body and the mouthfeel, but they also affect the aroma. They interact with the esters that are aromatic in the same way that cream has this viscous oily feeling in your mouth that just spreads out the flavors that's what the compounds of lacing do in your mouth does it matter I, I think it does I understand that some people disagree and that lacing is just you know purely aesthetic it certainly does have some aesthetic appeal to me I would try to improve the lacing on this one a little bit. I'd say the Munich Helles is my favorite style of all time, but this is a real close second. And my dad used to live in Belgium. He took me to a Deleuze store, which is the same company that owns um, Food Line grocery chain. You know, like the aisle in a Walmart store? There was an entire aisle, the full length of the store, on one, you know, one side of the aisle was all these different beers from all over the world. But the Belgian section was like maybe half of it. And it wasn't six packs. It was all individual bottles, priced individually, so that you could collect a sample. Man, that was fun. And I love the style. I tried everything. I tried the Lambic beers. I haven't developed a real taste for that. But if I'm going to get into this, I need to know how to make them. One of the things I find interesting about Belgian Saison beer is that the, the, the history of it. These days, you usually get a fairly strong beer, five, six, seven, even eight percent alcohol. Originally, the Belgians didn't do it that way. Uh, they would make it for their seasonal workers in the summer. As part of their pay, they would give them a fairly big allotment every day of this stuff and they would drink it during their breaks and at lunch, but they needed to stay productive and careful with the equipment. So it was a pretty light beer. It was a session beer of the day. Um, you know, three, maybe 4%. Ours came out at 5.99. Our attenuation was higher than expected. I still don't know why. Oh, yes I do. I pitched Belgian Saison 2 from uh, White Labs. But when it arrived in the mail, even though I had ordered the ice packs, it was hot. And the yeast was dead. And so after I pitched this, I had to repitch a couple of days later with some Danstar Belle Saison yeast. That yeast must have a greater attenuation than this Belgian Saison 2 which is hard to believe because this one is 81.5%.
basically, I don't know. I'm going to have to follow up. You'll need to go to the article. I'm going to put an article about this at the website, jigheadbrewing.com. I will hopefully have resolved this, so that'll be the follow-up, okay? That is delicious. Really, right now, I wish that it was a session beer so I could drink another glass of it because it's so inviting and so refreshing. You can download this recipe at our website. We started out with a great recipe from a really good company, Northern Brewer. You probably know them. And this is the Wheaton uh, from, from Will Wheaton. You know the guy on, uh, he played Wes Crusher on yeah. Star uh -huh. Trek Next Generation. He's apparently a friend of the guys who run Northern Brewer and he went to them and they developed this. Recipe is good. It uses uh, wheat, Belgian Pilsner, I added a little bit of DME to make up for our lack of efficiency. Nugget, Saz, and Kent Goldings. That's probably all you want to watch on a video, so I'm not going to get into all the details. For that, if you're interested, go to the website where I'll talk about this Saison beer. Our next review is going to be a Hefeweizen. And you're going to want to track these recipes, these beer projects. The reason for the funky names is I wanted my boys to have some sense of ownership of the company. So they named it. It's the Jig Head Brewing Company because they're big fans of fishing. So all of the beer names have some marine reference, whether it be fishing or fishing equipment or rivers, lakes, oceans, nautical terms, that kind of thing. This is going to be the Shannon Irish Red Ale, which is a river in Ireland. This is the Muscalunge IPA, which is a uh, sort of pike, and l'espadon bière de garde is, uh, l'espadon means um, swordfish. This is skipjack saison. Skipjack is a type of fish. Definitely subscribe so that you'll be notified of uh, new uploads when we upload a video. And go to the website and subscribe there so you'll be notified when I post any updates to the projects or an article. We're not going to give away your information to anybody. We're going to respect your privacy. It's definitely been my pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Manny Edwards at Jighead Brewing. Cheers. Let's get some more.